Well, to start us off, Ian, how are you? And where in the world are you right now? I'm really good. Um, I am actually back home with my parents for the first time in a long time. Um, it's been really nice being able to see them. I'm, I guess I should tell you where that is. I'm back in Bloomington, Indiana, um, smack dab in the middle of the U.S., just hanging out with my parents and enjoying life in this crazy time. Sounds amazing. <laughs> um, I know as an ex-swimmer myself, post, post-retirement couple of weeks is amazing to spend with your parents, just not having to go to practice, sometimes having your mom cook for you. It's, it's, it's a great feeling. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's been great. <laughs> but bouncing off from that, Ian, we have a couple of big themes I kind of want to tackle today. But um, let's start with discussing the previous ISL season. Um, how would you analyze the performance of DC Tridents in ISL Budapest? And sort of what was your overall feel postseason? Yeah, so season two went great. Um, I was really, you know, surprised that it actually went on. But, you know, when we got to Budapest, everything was set up in a way that made it possible for us to actually do the season. Everything kind of went flawlessly, and I was, I was pretty surprised by that. DC Trident as a whole, I thought we did great. Um, we lost some swimmers, obviously, because of uh, Australia and the whole thing that went on with that. We lost some of our better swimmers. Um, uh, Ledecky also we had the year before. So we took some big hits, but as a team, I think we rallied. Um, and we really kind of embraced being the underdog in a lot of meets. Uh, the first meet going up against um, Aqua Centurions, like that was amazing. Uh, very close meet. Uh, personal performances. Um, I didn't honestly expect too much because I had been out of the water, obviously, because of COVID. Um, training really hadn't been very consistent at the time. Uh, very happy, though, with overall performance for me and then beyond happy with how DC Trident performed as a, as a unit, a team. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, you guys, from one point of view, I mean, probably the aspirations were higher, making it to the semis, to the final, potentially. But you guys were a cohesive unit as a team. And just seeing you guys get after each other was honestly a pleasure for the eye. It was amazing. Yeah, it was. As a team, I think we we were probably more cohesive than any other team. And I'd argue with anyone about that. We all had says in how what we could swim and how we could help benefit the team. We had guys stepping up for off events, even though their normal event was three events later, just because we had to have somebody swim that. And there was nobody that, um, you know, said, no, I don't want to do that. Everybody was game for anything at any point. And we also, I think, had the best team around, no matter what the scoreboard said. I mean, you couldn't tell by our cheering and, you know, by the enthusiasm that our team brought. So. Plus, you had some amazing performances on, on the DC Trident side also. Mm-hmm. Hey, oh, um, exactly. But you kind of already touched base a little bit on the training before Budapest, but could you sort of shed a little bit more light on it? And I also know that um, in summer 2020, you decided to train with Energy Standard at Gloria Sports Arena a little bit. Um, could you tell me a little bit more on why you decided to do so and how, what did you think about the experience? Yeah, so... I guess I have to rewind a little bit back to spring of 2020. Um, I had decided I wanted a change of pace being that the Olympics had been um, delayed. Olympic trials had been delayed. So I actually left Indiana to go train elsewhere that ended up being energy standard, but with the way international travel was looking um, it kind of got pushed back and pushed back until I think around almost July is the first time I went out there. And I went out there for a preliminary trial run of three weeks, came back to the U S got situated and went out there again. Um, it was a great experience. Uh, I don't think I would have ever really gotten to know a lot of the guys from energy standard, unless I had went out there. I mean, Ben proud, amazing person, Sarah Shortsham, Flora Mandu. Uh, I consider them all friends at this point, being able to spend all that time out there with them. But Either way, I was still kind of going on on almost like a three week on one week off, two week off sort of cycle until we got out there about eight weeks before Budapest began. So the training was still very intermittent, um, but it was a great experience. Turkey's beautiful. Um, the resort area we stayed at, everything was just amazing. Um, now you, you've seen the both sides, sort of how the European athletes train and how the U.S. athletes train. 
what would you say is the biggest difference? It's a lot more um, relaxed, I would say, in a good way. You Like we would come to the pool and there'd be 20 minutes of stretch or do whatever you need to actually get ready for practice. And that's just not something I'm used to with uh, collegiate swimming. Collegiate swimming is more um, structured and rigid. Uh, you have a lot more people doing sort of the same thing. And as well with energy standard, it's a smaller group. I think we had almost a two to one athlete to coach ratio. So it, you were always getting very specific work at any time. And that's something that's a lot different than uh, college. Uh, I believe I, IU where I had trained for college. I mean, I'd say it's almost 15 to one. So it's a very big difference. Um, each have their positives, negatives, I think for sure. But getting to see that other side of training um, was eye-opening, I thought. Would you say that the relationship between athlete and swimmer with the European guys is more sort of personal in a way, more friendly kind of thing, other than um, this is the boss and I have to do what the boss says in a way? Yeah, I think, I think that's more of a case, maybe not of, a, uh, of American and European, but rather the collegiate system as a whole, right? You In college, you might be swimming because you're on scholarship and the coach, obviously, you're giving something to them in exchange for that scholarship. And when you transition into a professional athlete, whether or not it's under an American or European coach, I think it becomes more of a mutual um, relationship rather than a um, subordinate and sort of I am the boss relationship with the coach. Right. So I don't know if it's an American European thing or if it's rather just a collegiate versus professional sort of um, environment. Got it. Thank you, Ian. Ian, at ISL 2020, though you did swim a lot of breaststroke events, um, you surprised everyone with your freestyle and fly. Did training with energy standard inspire you to focus on other strokes as well? Or was this sort of part of the plan after, after previous ISL? Um, so in college, I actually swam freestyle quite a bit and I was a tuner diameter. So I, I had had experience with it, but when I first went out to energy standard, um, James Gibson and I kind of realized that the breaststroke really wasn't on. I mean, we were having a lot of trouble with that in practice in general. And by the time ISL rolled around, it still wasn't solved. Um, timing was off. The kick was off. And we just decided to throw me in a freestyle event and see if it was rather me being out of shape or the breaststroke. Like I said, the technical technique was not there and the freestyle was good and the fly was good. So I think it was more of an issue with the actual timing of breaststroke and the specifics on it. And I was pretty surprised, honestly, with the freestyle. Actually, the night before I did a 50 to a foot long course meters and I was extremely close to almost one of my best 50 out splits in the hundred free. So we were like, Oh, well, we might as well try it. Uh, this is why we're here to race and see what's working and what's on. So I, I, and once again, it was awesome being able to step up for DC in that way, even though I wasn't having a very good personal performance with breast show to be able to help the team and freestyle and fly was great. Absolutely. A couple of times you had the fastest split on your team freestyle yeah. split that it was amazing to see. Don't get me wrong, thank um, you. but thank you, Ian. Ian, something else I wanted to talk to you regarding the ISL season 2020 is, I don't know how closely you were following it, but there was some controversy between Mel Martian and Ilya Shimanovich regarding the legality of Ilya's breaststroke kick. Um, are you aware of the situation? And if you are, um, what do you think of it? Yeah, so I, I am aware of the situation and I think Across the board, obviously not naming any athletes, there were some that you'd see doing that sort of dolphin into the wall, whether it be an IM or uh, Warren breaststroke. Uh, as far as his kick, I think his kick is normal breaststroke kick. I know some people pointed out that. I think it's under the certain context of the rules, and FINA rules are pretty vague, to be honest, when it comes to the actual stroke uh, legality of breaststroke. Um, and his, his normal kick seems to be legal. Obviously, the blitz like the blade and dolphin kick into the wall isn't really, you know, that's not really something you should be doing. But I mean, I struggled with the same thing in college. There'd be guys I'd dive in the water and I'd see him take two, maybe three dolphin kicks off the start. And it's just something where, you know, you, you don't want to be the one to do it, but it's really sucky when somebody else is doing it next to you. Um, 
but it, it was nice to see, I think, somebody within the sport kind of call it out rather than it just brushing under the table, right? I think in swimming, um, it's kind of a sport where there's a stigma if you call somebody out, like leave it to the officials. But I think what Mel did was, was right and, you know, bringing attention to the matter. So um, hopefully those issues are fixed and, you know, underwater review becomes a common thing. I think that's good for the sport, at least for that, maybe not for some more specific things, but I think underwater review should become a lot more used and, uh, and enforced for sure. Thank you, Ian. And it's interesting because I spoke already both to Ilya and to Adam Peaty and both of them, I mean, they have very opposing, um, opposing points of view on this matter, but both of them agree that um, underwater footage should be part of um, judging of swimming and it should be introduced as early as before 2021 uh, Olympic games. Right. Um, and it's, it's hard too, because brushstrokes always evolving, right? I mean, it's a stroke that was a, like butterfly and brushstroke are very similar in a lot of ways. And they kind of came from the same thing. So it's, it him changing the kick like might right now might seem oh that's bad but at the same time if it ends up being faster maybe that'll be the way brush strokes taught in 15 years right now that i'm talking more so about his kick during the actual pulling phase so you never know i mean everybody's going to try to do everything within the actual rule book to get faster so maybe fina maybe fina's the one that needs to step in and make the rules more specific on what you can and cannot do within the actual pull and kick phase of the breaststroke, so. Absolutely, thank you, Ian. Um, sort of talking about the change in the rule book in general, uh, there's one more topic I wanna to touch base on is short access turns. Um, I've heard some, some people say that um, there's a problem in terms of what, what is considered a disqualification in terms of double arm touch or one, one arm touches after another. Um, right. I've heard a lot of people say that the rule should be that you should at some point touch with both arms, but you don't have to necessarily do it simultaneously. Um, I've heard other people say that one arm is sufficient. Um, what is your point of view on this matter? Honestly, I, I think it should be changed from what it is now, right? And this is what I was talking about when I was talking about the specifics of actual underwater view, because once you get into the rabbit hole of underwater reviews and it's like, all right, let's check every single person's turn. And even if it's within, I mean, everybody's seen the Michael Phelps finish, right? I mean, and that he's finishing within a microsecond of, with both hands, but one hand is still hitting the wall first. Right. And it's like, well, is that, is that a DQ? I don't think it should be. Um, I think turns, whether they change it to one hand um, is fine or alternating hands is fine. I think, it has to be changed though from a two hand touch. I mean, it seems like a simple thing to change that would keep a lot of, um, it would just, it keeps people from then doing, you know, the sneaky, I did a one hand touch, but it looked like a two hand touch. And then it's well, well, did they get an advantage? And then you can kind of just get rid of that whole controversy by just making it. So no, if you touch with one hand, you're good. You're, you're ready to go. And it's really easy to tell if somebody doesn't touch with one hand, if you have, touch pads on either side to show, you know, well, it didn't look like they uh, hit twice. So I think it needs to be changed. I don't know if it ever will be, but um, it's just one of those things that would make life, I think, easier and lead to less controversy if it's, if it's that way. Absolutely. It's also quite hard to even do a short access turn without touching at least with one hand, right? Right, exactly. I mean, there's been plenty of times where I've accidentally hit with one hand first, but you know, I'm trying to hit with two hands, but the intention is never to hit with one hand first. I think anybody that consciously tries to do that is going to make it very obvious that they did a non-simultaneous turn. So, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Mm -hmm. Ian, um, kind of moving on, um, recently you dropped a post on Instagram saying that you're done with your career as a professional athlete. Um, could you tell us a little bit more on what inspired this decision and by the way, um, congrats on your job at Red Bull now, right? Yeah, that, thank you. That's huge. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, so it was a culmination of things, right? So um, leading up to the 2020 trials, I was actually doing my master's at Indiana University. 
And I was doing a lot of schoolwork and finding a lot of passion in um, sort of getting into the corporate world and, you know, maybe even pursuing a higher education after my master's. And when I kind of had made the decision that after 2020, I was going to be done. I was ready to move on. I had a great career. I'd swam for 12 years and it wasn't something that, you know, I was 100% passionate about anymore. And when the games actually got delayed, um, I didn't know. Like at that time, I was like, Ooh, I think I might be done. I had the experience though, to go out to energy standards. So I thought I'd try to take that. And then when COVID hit again, pretty hard in Europe and I wasn't able to actually go back, um, the decision came again, like, well, what do you know? Well, well, like I'm in the same position again. I don't really have anywhere to train. Um, I'm ready to move on and pursue other things. Um, so I went and actually swam for an old coach that I had at IU in Alabama. And he actually got fired about three months into me being there. So then I was in the same situation once again, having no coach. Um, and I think, you know, the passion slipped every single time that that had happened. And I was kind of just over relocating my life when I didn't know if I was 100% like into swimming at that point. And then there was still, you know, do the Olympics even go on? Do they happen? Like there could be a mutation two months down the line where the Olympics are called off. And, you know, I've just spent the next eight months training for something that I didn't necessarily know if I really wanted anymore. So I think all those little things together kind of just led me to the decision that I was at terms with kind of what I had done. I mean, I had set American records in short course and short course meters and I kind of made it a deal with myself or made it come to terms that I was going to be done in 2020 and like now it's 2021 and I'm still going. Right. So um, I actually had started putting out feelers for jobs and gotten an interview with Red Bull during that time. And it was a five week long interview process, but um, I ended up getting a job that started in Atlanta in the summer. And I was like, I think I'm done. I think I'm, I'm, I'm more excited about this to prepare and, you know, move my life out to Atlanta um, and, you know, use everything that swimming, giving, swimming has given me from traits and, you know, what sort of values I carry as a person and use it to something else. So that was in short kind of what had happened. Absolutely. Ian, first of all, congratulations on an amazing career. Um, Thank you. We're going to miss you at the ISL for sure. Um, <laughs> But with that being said, it seems like you kind of set your mind on being done with swimming even prior to 2020 apocalypse in a way. Um, do you remember the exact time you sort of thought, you know what, my, my swimming, my passion for swimming is somewhat gone. Um, I, I kind of want to move on. Do you remember the exact moment that happened? Yeah. So like I said, I was doing my master's um, at during that training year leading up to 2020. Um, I was really enjoying some of the work I was doing with that um, and excited about kind of applying all of this to, you know, a real world experience, right? Like actually getting a job and, you know, moving somewhere different. I'd been in Indiana my whole life, right? I was born in Indiana. My parents live in Indiana. I went to Indiana for college. And also at the same time in 2018 and 2019, like I had kind of accomplished really what my ultimate goal in swimming was. I vividly remember sitting in high school, sophomore year of high school, uh, while I would have been like 16, uh, saying to myself that I wanted to break 50 in the 100 breasts. Like that was the first year I started doing breaststroke. And at that time, I think I was a 55, I think, in high school. And I was like, I'm going to be the first person under 50. So for a long time, that was sort of the ultimate goal. And I kind of accomplished that junior year and then senior year again. So I felt accomplished in that from, from that perspective. And then as well as I had a lot of hobbies outside of swimming that I felt like I honestly couldn't do because of swimming. Um, I love rock climbing and I love hiking and, and to ask any swimmer ever after practice, what's the last thing I want to do and it's physical activity. So I, I never got to kind of pursue those things to the amount I wanted to, or, you know, go on vacations, go skiing and do all these things. Um, so I think all of that together really kind of made up my mind. I was ready to just move on to the next chapter in life after 12 years of giving myself to the sport. Makes sense. Thank you, Ian.
What are, what are these activities? You mentioned rock climbing, you mentioned skiing, um, anything else you're really into right now? So rock climbing was a big one. Um, ever since probably freshman year of college, I had a friend that was an old swimmer on the swim team. He's like, let's go rock climbing. It's a, there's this rock climbing place in Bloomington. And I fell in love with it. Like it's, it's amazing being able to, it, when you're on a wall, it's completely different levels of pushing yourself, right? Like everybody pushes themselves in the pool, but the worst thing that happens in the pool when you get tired is you slow down. And I tell people on the wall, worst thing that happens when you're on the wall is you fall off the wall. Your body doesn't want to fall off the wall. So it's able to push itself to a much higher level, in my opinion. And just the fatigue and, you know, the, the what you feel like after you've accomplished that is just amazing. Um, and then skiing was one that I'd always wanted to do. But, you know, the risk of injury is like far too high to risk your body for something like that, especially when you've never tried it. Um, and I think there was always that fear with a lot of activities um, that I had wanted to do. And I think now that I'm away from the sport, like I had, I've gone skiing two or three times now and it's been a blast. I've been able to rock climb. I've been able to start projects as far as like woodworking goes. And it's just, I have all this free time and my job doesn't start till June. So now I'm thinking about going on a huge 2000 mile road trip and it just feels so free, right. That you're able to do all these things. So. Yeah. It sounds like you're living the life. Wow. When we're talking about rock climbing, is it indoor sort of bouldering style or is it uh, outdoor with a, what kind yeah. of rock climbing is it? So I learned on indoor, right? Um, there's bouldering, which is without a rope. And then there's top rope with a rope that hangs from the ceiling. And then there's actually lead climbing, which is when you hook yourself in as you go. And that's actually my favorite um, version of climbing. And I've gone twice i think out to some real walls in red river gorge and it's a lot more daunting <laughs> i feel a lot more comfortable when i'm on the indoor wall but like i said the outdoor was always you know it wasn't really a possibility because it's you're a lot more susceptible to injury being out there right and i've always wanted to go out to yosemite and climb some of the walls out there and it's just now i have that opportunity right so it's, it's definitely like i said it comes back to you know that freeing feeling so, oh wow, that is amazing. Um, by the way, Ian, I, I actually ended up doing a little bit of rock climbing myself after my swimming career. And I thought it was an amazing exercise to even maybe double up with swimming. There, you, you learn to control your body so much better. You learn to sort of to relax while you're tensing a lot better mm -hmm. than you do even in the water. Do you feel like there's benefit on ro in rock climbing for a swimming career? So I actually did the most rock climbing my junior year, which is the year that I thought I was in the best tip shape for breaststroke in, in general. And then I know Sarah Shortstrom actually had climbed a little bit as well too in the past and called it some cross training. But I think, yeah, you're right. On the wall, you can't tense up. I mean, you've got the blood flow. you got to fight against gravity. And I think swimmers in general tend to be very um, – I wouldn't say unathletic, but, you know, not as athletic in the water as they might be on land and climbing really will show that it's so core driven. It, you get to lose a lot of legs and it's a lot of arms. So I think honestly, the more you move outside the waters is, is good cross training. And I think you're starting to see a lot of people figure that out from an American perspective and age group perspective because they haven't been able to use pools. So any sort of dry land and rock climbing, especially I think has been is, is super beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Ian, um, coming back on your decision to be done with swimming, I kind of wanted to touch base upon the reasons why you were in swimming initially. Um, could you reveal to me what was your grand motivation for swimming? Was it sort of the athlete lifestyle? What is it, was it the thrill of competition? Maybe the desire to win? Maybe the love for the activity swimming itself? Yeah, so I actually started when I was 12. Um, I was looking for something to do in between fall and spring baseball, actually. Um, and I saw some swimming tryout flyer and I went, um, coach told me, hey, you should be in swimming. You shouldn't be in baseball. I had swam a little bit at like summer camps beforehand, but nothing serious. Um, I don't think I really got too serious about swimming until I was about 14, 15. And then that was because I, I, I loved winning and I loved competition. There's something so pure about, swimming and the fact that 
you're not really influenced by any others, maybe psychologically, but physically you're not influenced. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and also sort of the individualistic style of it too. Um, it really felt like I was pushing myself as a person and in baseball, you kind of had that, but at the same time playing first base, you really had no influence over somebody playing shortstop or third base. And I think with swimming, it, it all fell on you. And that was something that really interested me and really piqued my, um, competitive attitude. And then ever since that, I think that's what kind of helped me push through the sport was, um, that competitiveness and sort of striving to always be better. Got it. Thank you. Ian, do you have any regrets as an athlete regarding your professional career? You know, not really. Um, I think everybody has like minor regrets, but I, I don't think anybody should ever dwell on that because no matter what route you look at, it's like, you're going to always have some sort of regret with it. I think maybe some funny ish regrets is I always wanted to do a 500 freestyle suited and shaved. Like I, I bugged Ray to do that for a long time, never got the chance to do it. Um, and then I guess I wouldn't even say being more serious at a younger age because I think I might have burned down the sport earlier. So I think I'm very happy with how swimming turned out. And I don't think I really have any, any, any regrets. No, I think it's been a great ride. And I think um, for the most part, it was a very successful 12 years and I don't think I'd change anything. Ian, I, I believe you're not too out of shape yet. Um, 500 <laughs> freestyle suited is still an option. We can do a whole ISL <laughs> event regarding it. Goodbye, yeah, Ian. I mean, 500 free. Uh, there may there might not be an Ian after that right now. I, I <laughs> actually haven't touched the water in almost two or three months, so I, I haven't done any of that. <laughs> that makes sense. Totally makes sense. Thank you, Ian. Um, Ian, do you see yourself being involved with swimming one way or another? after your professional athlete career ended maybe maybe as a coach later on maybe as a master son so I don't think I'll be involved in that capacity with swimming um I think in the end I would love to be an athletic director and in that way I'd still have some sort of hand in the swimming program at a school um a much more managerial and business aspect of it I guess the closest thing I'll get to swimming is I know one of my supervisors I'm working for knows a, um, a water polo team out in Atlanta that he'd love for me to go hang out with and see if I've got what it takes to be on that. But I don't think I'll ever be a, a, a coach for swimming. Um, I, I love the sport, but like I said, it's been a very long chapter of my life. And I think, um, I could better serve swimming as a sport from an athletic director uh, perspective or something more along those lines. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Ian, um, whenever I speak with a recently retired athlete, I feel like I have a unique opportunity to ask you about your predictions for upcoming big events without you being too biased. So with that being yeah. said, what are your predictions for, for the podium in 100 and 200 breaststroke for Tokyo 2021? 100 and 200 breaststroke. Um, I think, I think PD is probably going to take it. Um, I mean, he's obviously the outstanding favorite. So, um, you know, pretty boring in that aspect saying that he's going to win. <clears throat> and then I think two and two and three, you have quite a few guys that are really stepping up. I mean, you've got, um, Ilya, Arna, I might be butchering his name, Kaminga. Um, and then there was, uh, and then you have Emery also who had a stellar ISL performance. And then there's some Americans that I think could, could really show up at try at the Olympics. Um, it's always interesting to see, um, how different the Olympics are from say a world championships when it comes to the times and then 200, I honestly don't know. I mean, that's something I tried to stay away from was the 200 long course, but, um, I'm hoping we get at least one American um, on the podium, whether it be Andrew Wilson, Nick Fink, Cody Miller. Um, um, I, I do really like Creel Pergoda. Um, he was a good friend that I kind of, kind of met at World University Games, so I'd like to see him up there maybe. But um, I'm probably more confident in my 100 predictions rather than anything else. So I'll All be right. watching, though. For sure. I'll, I'll definitely be watching if the Olympic Games do go on. I will for sure be watching. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ian. What about your predictions for the upcoming um, ISL season? I know the draft hasn't happened yet. But... Yeah, um, it depends. I mean, I really got to look at rosters. I think if the rosters stay kind of the same way they did, um, now you have two different kind of like reigning champs. So it'd be interesting to see how they go against each other. Um, I really like the Frogs uh, this last season. I would love for them to kind of, you know, take the next step, be top one or top two. They had the coolest uniforms and, you know, the coolest walkout. So love to see them do well. And then obviously DC Triton. I mean, I'm still going to be a DC Triton fan for the rest of my time since I did my two seasons with them. Still stay in very close contact with Caitlin Sandino, the GM. So it's, it's always, um, always going to be in the back of my mind. I'm a DC fan. So I'll always have my sweatshirts and all my suits and stuff. So. Of course. Thank you. Ian, Ian moving um, into the territory of our fan questions. Um, one of our fans really wants to know, what is your opinion on your former teammates, Cody Miller swim blog? Yeah. So um, I love what Cody's been able to do with himself as far as swimming goes, you know, being able to reach a much larger population on youtube i think he actually probably has the most reach of any swimmer honestly having that platform Andrew, probably yeah yeah so i think they're both both of them had those logs and it's just great i mean it's that that's how you kind of get swimming bigger i believe is he's really using youtube as a platform there's some people that browse through and then you know stumble across cody's cody's logs and then you know fall in love with the sport i will say when i was swimming with him it was sometimes kind of annoying when he'd push the camera in my face after a tuna press and like get it away from me. Like I, I, I can't deal with this right now. So um, I, I'm, I'm really happy for him. It, it's a great, great, great thing he's doing for the sport and himself. So shout out Cody Miller. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, with that being said, um, one of our fans wants to know, Ian, what was your sleep schedule like when you swam and did you suffer from insomnia? before I begin um my sleep schedule before it really depended on kind of if I had practice the next day I think in college obviously that changed as I went from freshman to senior year but I I tried to get at least eight hours it just depended on what the actual next day held and when when I'd be practicing um I don't think I ever really suffered from insomnia at meets I mean maybe freshman year I was super nervous but after that I didn't nearly get the jitters or shakes like some like I used to before meets um just try to get in bed at an early enough time that even if it takes me an hour to fall asleep I'm still falling asleep at a good time so I, I never really experienced any of that and I'm thankful that I didn't do you have any tips on um overcoming jet lag so honestly I never really experienced jet lag too much I just tried to sleep the whole flight um I, I really enjoy flying and I know some people don't, that's why they can't sleep. So for me, jet lag was never really a problem. I just remember falling asleep after the flight took off and then I'd wake up to the plane hitting the ground. So, um, I would say get an eye mask, get a nice one. So you can actually sleep on the plane. Don't use the plane ones because they usually aren't, aren't good enough. But other than that, I don't really have any tips. Sorry. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Sort of on another note, um, Ian, do you do any mental preparation prior to a race? So, yeah, yes and no. I do just enough, right? I, I don't want to overfocus on a race. I think I'll go back to junior year of college because that, that was a big one for me. I would do in Wednesday and Friday mornings, I think. I would lay on a mat and our coach would have us close our eyes and just think about swimming for five minutes and that that was kind of the visualization that I did um immediately before a race I would think about just one thing that I wanted to do correctly whether it be keep the head in the right position or or pull extra hard on the third wall um I know a lot a lot of people are more into the visualization but I never wanted to overdo it because I think that can cause stress and anxiety so I, I just tried to do just enough that I felt comfortable with it Fair enough. Thank you. Have you ever tried working with a sports psychiatrist or something along the lines of? Um, I think I, I really struggled freshman and sophomore year with like the workload of swimming and um, 
and school. And I actually utilized one then and I thought it was, it was great. Um, kind of realizing that you need to make priorities of some things and they help you sort through that and help you talk you through that. So I think in that sense, I utilize it, maybe not for like a visualization, but actually dealing with the stress that comes from being an athlete and a student at the same time. Got it. Thank you, Ian. Ian, what about diet? Um, how closely did you follow your diet when you were a swimmer? And did you have sort of a dietary plan? So I guess this could go back to when you asked me if I had any regrets. I didn't really focus on my diet hardly ever. And I think um, maybe that could have hurt me. But at the same time, you have swimmers that what seems like they can eat anything and they still perform. Um, so I never really tried to focus too much on my diet. I ate healthy. Like I tried to eat colorful, but I wasn't counting calories. I wasn't counting protein and carb intake. I wasn't counting fat. Um, I didn't try any special diets. I know like Michael, like Michael Andrew likes to do keto. And I never really got into any of that. I kind of just at the time. I would eat what I kind of wanted to, and then try to eat healthy, try to stay away from sweets for the most part. But when you're training, like you do at Indiana, like you, sometimes you break down and it's like, I, I got to have some donuts. Like I, I, I have to do it. So it's, I think if I had one minor regret, that would be it that I didn't necessarily take the diet extremely seriously. So got it. would your weight fluctuate throughout the season or would it stay relatively stable? Um, honestly, I stayed relatively stable and then taper, I would actually lose a little bit of weight. I think, um, I would be anywhere from 188 pounds, 187 pounds to 192 ish, um, tapers when I was really kind of 187, 188. Um, so it, I would say that's kind of within the realm though, of normalcy. That's not anything too crazy. I've heard guys that cut 20 pounds for swimming. And I think there might be some validity to that, right? You have boxers that do it and fighters that do it. And I think if you're able to retain, you know, um, the ability to be healthy when you do it, I think it's, it's a good idea. Maybe it's just something people have to look into as the sport evolves. The big difference between swimming and fighting is that we don't have weight classes, right? Right. Exactly. Which is another big topic. Why don't we have weight classes? But that's not another matter. <laughs> right. Um, right. With that being said, Ian, um, now that you're done with swimming, um, any favorite sort of snack, any favorite guilty food pleasure you now have um, that, that you're able to satisfy yourself without feeling guilty for? <laughs> Honestly, like I've probably been eating healthier now than I did when I was swimming, which sounds really bad. Um, <laughs> probably not something I should admit, but I think I like thought, you know, I can enjoy like these snacks as like I'm swimming, but now for the most part, I probably stay away from it more than I did while I was swimming. Um, I try to eat a lot more vegetables, more, more vegetarian options when I can now. Cause I'm like, Oh, I don't want to get big now that I'm like not swimming. Right. So I think I ate a lot more sweets and indulged a lot more when I was swimming. And that kind of goes back to maybe a slight regret for uh, not watching the diet too much. So fair enough. Thank you, Ian. Ian, with that being said, um, let's move to the blitz portion of this podcast, if you don't mind. Okay. So here we go. First question. Do you have a pet? I have two dogs. I have a Pomeranian and Australian shepherd named Finn and Emma. So mm, interesting. Do they distract you from, from swimming well? When, when so I swim? never, yeah. So when I was swimming in high school, not really, no. I, I They were just kind of there to play with when I was needy and needed them. So Fair enough. <laughs> what was your average yardage for training? That has fluctuated a lot throughout my life. A lot, a lot, a lot. I think um, in IU, it could have been 60, 65,000 down to energy standard at 30,000. High school could have been more. I have no idea. I've done a lot of different training programs, so it's fluctuated a lot. Um, from listening to a couple of your previous podcasts, I know that you do a lot of sort of aerobic training in, in your preparation. Um, what is your opinion on Michael's Andrew training routine, sort of the race pace, um, no, no real warm down, little warm up, um, all, all, all done at an effort that you would be doing an, an actual race at. I think it's great. I mean, I, I've, I've seen all sorts, all sides of the coin. 
um, when it comes to training. And I think what he's doing is great. I mean, you still are holding your heart rate, even if you don't warm down at a very high level, which you would be at aerobic anyways. And I, I'm with him on the warm down. I haven't warmed down since freshman year of college, maybe. So oh, I wow. did at meets all warm down, but practice, I don't see a point. You're going to be, I think you're going to be fully recovered within a 12 hour, 24 hour period, whenever you're training next. So I haven't warmed down sort of in that same manner, but I think you got to find whatever mentally makes you the happiest, right? There's people that if they did that, they would think they're not getting anything out of it. And there's the same thing when it comes to aerobics. Some people are like, I'm not getting anything out of this. You can still get some sort of aerobic adaptation from what he's doing, obviously, since he's still doing so well in the tuner I am. So I think to each their own, and I wouldn't mind doing it either way. Yeah, and by the way, I'm, 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 all, I'm on the same page with you regarding warm downs, but um, do you feel like they could actually hurt your performance as a swimmer? Because you tend to get very sloppy in your warm downs. You don't focus on your technique. Um, you're, you're essentially kind of not only wasting your time, but you're hurting yourself as a swimmer, right? Right, and I think if, if you actually look into like some of the scientific studies, I know – over here, actually in Indiana, we have the swim science center who is completely just focused on the science of swimming. And there's a lot of mixed studies on whether or not warm down actually helps you preventing injury or preventing, you know, fatigue or anything like that. So, um, and to me, yeah, like you said, I think it can hurt technique. If you're swimming warm down and you're just throwing your hands in the water for me, if I wanted to warm down, maybe I should just go get around the deck and walk around, right. You're still moving. You're still at the same heart rate and then, but then you're not ruining your stroke. So I think there's a lot of studies and I think swimming is honestly in its infancy when it comes to actually applying science to the sport. Um, it's not like track where it's been studied to death. Right. So I think swimming is going to take that leap soon. 100%. By the way, this is not a question on the blitz, but what do you think of freestyle arms, butterfly kick as the future of swimming? So I actually tried that um, in, in, in college uh, cause I believe Phelps did it at a national meet. He did dolphin kick with freestyle arms into the wall. I think in a tuner I am, I believe just to finish it out. And I had tried it like once or twice. I didn't have the coordination to do it cause I didn't really practice it that much, but it seems like you get a lot of force out of a dolphin kick and the freestyle arms. If you can get the actual tempo down and you know, the, the, the sequency with the arms and legs, I think it could be, it could be viable. Like I said, swimming is just, always evolving because there's just so many more ways you can affect your forward momentum and your forward force compared to like track, for example, you're, you're, you're in a 3d fluid, right? Like it's, it's a lot different. hundred percent plus people have been running for forever, right? But people have been right. swimming for relatively not that long, especially paying attention to what they do in the water. Right. And exactly. You, and, and at the same point, we were evolved to run, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's what we're made to do. That's what we've evolved to do. And swimming is not at all what we are meant to do. So finding more efficient ways is something that's going to happen more and more often, I believe. Absolutely. So thank you. Again. Ian, who is the best currently active swimmer in your opinion? Before this podcast, I actually thought about this because, like, somebody's going to ask me this question. So I think Ledecky and Petey are the most dominant in their events. And then I think Dressel and Sarah have got to be some of the best all around. I think there's a difference. you got to, like, because I think there's – Ledecky, for example, is far more dominant in her events than I think Phelps probably was in his lifetime in his events. But at the same time, I think Phelps was the better swimmer just because he could do so many different things, right? So I think it, right now it's got to be probably Ledecky and Petey is the most dominant and then the most overreaching and, you know, versatile swimmers got to be Dressel and Sarah. That's a thought out answer. Thank you. Thank yeah. You um, Ian, what is your um, personal preference? Long course meters, short course meters or yards? So I haven't had much short course meters expand, uh, like experience, um, but as far as training goes, I really enjoyed swimming long course meters when I was at energy standard. And that's probably, that could be just because, I mean, I've been swimming yards for 12 years. Right. So it's being able to do that change probably was much needed and I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think I, if I had to pick the one that I would do for the rest of my life, as like a master swimmer, it'd be long course for sure. 
I, I I enjoy that more at this point in my time. So, makes sense. Thank you, Ian. What is your favorite event to swim? Favorite event to swim. So it definitely depends on. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I really I really enjoyed it, but I think it really depends on if it's short course or long course. Um, like I, I hated swimming the two hundred breast long course, but I was fine swimming it in short course. Um, I think my favorite event though to swim probably hundred meter free long course. I think it's a good, um, good pace that you start out at. Like it's fast obviously, but you can't just completely spin out like you can a hundred yard. And then obviously hundred yard breaststroke is probably up there as well. Just cause I mean, that's kind of where I made my name for myself and that's where I had the most success, but those two are probably my favorite. Makes sense. Thank you. What about your favorite event to spectate? 400 I am. Sure. Yeah, I love the 400 I am because it's you really get to see, like I said, who's the better overall swimmer, right? And it's I think that's the event that determines it. Um, in a sense, it's kind of like watching the decathlon track. Um, but it's just so exciting to see the lead changes and that go on the race where it's like, oh, that guy's a breaststroker. Look, he's he's catching up, he's catching up. And I think it's an event I always wanted to swim, but I was too big of a baby to swim it. I think I could have been good at it, but I was like, oh, I don't really want to train for that. I don't know. I'd, I'd get like 150 in and be like, oh, I think I'm done. <laughs> so on the same, I'm on the same page. I would get the 75 <laughs> in and I'm like, oh, I think, I think I'm done. That's good. Um, does that fall into the category of one of those small regrets you had about your career? I can't call it a regret because I've had so many coaches. I had like two age group coaches try to push it on me. A high school coach tried to push it on me. I was like, nope, 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 nope. So I don't have a regret about it, but it's something that, you know, maybe in a different lifetime, but. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Ian, did you have a childhood idol? And if you did, who was it? Childhood idol. So I think as far as a childhood idol goes is I really liked this movie about an old track athlete um, called Steve Prefontaine. And if anybody doesn't know who he is, should definitely check him out. Um, he kind of took the what was deemed normal in track and like threw it out the window. And in track, you have people that draft behind each other until the last possible moment. And then you sprint. And he was a guy that's like, I don't want to do that. So he tried to lead the race from the very beginning to the very end. And I think that just stuck with me when it came to breaststroke. I mean, 200 yard breaststroke, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be winning from the beginning. And if I lose, then somebody else really had to try to pass me. So I think that probably is still one of my idols when it comes to the, the sport world. I mean, that guy was amazing. Um, his life ended too soon, but it's, it's something everybody should check out for sure. Thank you. Noted. Um, Ian, how much, how much, how much time did you have to spectate the ISL outside of your matches um, this season, this past season? How much time did I get to watch? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, a lot. And it was great. I mean, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy watching swimming um, from a numbers perspective. Cause like I, I, I generally have a good sense of where everybody's best times are. And it's, it's fun and interesting to watch that. And I think ISL makes it even more so to see, you know, where the teams are. And then as a swimming nerd, the jackpot was pretty cool. I'm not sure how it fared with people that kind of were uneducated about swimming, but as a swimming nerd, jackpot was amazing. I was trying to calculate in my head, like, where are they going to be? Where are they going to end up? How many points are they going to steal? And then trying to figure out how many points, like, Dressel was going to steal in the 100 IM. I was super cool. And I think, you know, maybe if betting becomes big in swimming, that's something I'll take up on just to make it more interesting for myself and see how good my swim knowledge actually is. So, Yeah, 100%. Um, it would be interesting to see uh, Ian Finnerty's um, – predictions for betting for the upcoming season <laughs> something like that oh that would be that would be golden um why i bring this up though is um there was a swimmer leonardo Santos. i don't know if you followed any of his races but he he swam stuff like 200 fly 400 individual medley 200 individual medley and he took the approach you were talking about yeah no i watched i watched some of his races <laughs> that was so was cool like, to see right Right. And actually, I, it reminded me during the ISL season, I was like, why don't they have an 800 free where every single hundred somebody gets out, right? You have a giant red line at the bottom of the pool. 
And that pushes people to really get after it in that 800 and really start to fly. And I was like, that guy would be great at that. That guy would be awesome. And I think, and I just, I just clicked that guy so well. I had never met him, but at the time I was like, we'd be good friends. We'd be good friends. Cause I remember the 200 yard breaststroke junior year. I just went out and Andrew Salascar was reeling me in every single stroke. And I was like, I'm going to die. Like I'm going to die in this pool right now at like the 125 mark. So mad respect to that guy. And it was, it made it a lot of fun to watch him race. Shout out Leonardo Santos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Um, Ian, what is your favorite sport to spectate and favorite sport to take part in outside of swimming? Favorite sport to spectate has got to be UFC. Um, I'm a big ultimate fighting fan. Um, I watch every single weekend. Um, favorite sport to spectate. Now that's a hard one. I mean, I loved obviously swimming, but I think it could just be childhood. Like, you know, I mean, I think I liked it more than I did, but I really enjoyed playing baseball. Um, anytime you can be out in the sun, I mean, swimming, practicing out in the sun was amazing, but outdoors is where I, I need to be. Right. So any, any outdoor sport is something I'm going to be enjoy i guess actually ultimate frisbee is probably one of my favorite sports i don't know if you know what that is but it's that's no, exactly an, an amazing sport yeah, yeah ultimate frisbee's got to be one of my favorite uh, we play it all the time in high school and that's you're outside and you can enjoy the fresh air so i'll say that that'll be my final answer ultimate frisbee <laughs> ultimate frisbee okay thank you makes sense it's the way i broke my ankle <laughs> 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 but um thank you ian um regarding ufc do you have any favorite fighters Ooh, so I think probably one of my favorites, I mean, it's kind of cliche, but I really like McGregor, George St. Pierre, um, big Tony Ferguson fan. Um, can't wait to see John Jones fight at heavyweight. Um, there's, I have quite a few that I, I really enjoy following. And then I just love watching all the different types of, of, of fighting come together, whether it be Brazilian jiu-jitsu and boxing and wrestling. And I think that's my favorite aspect. I'll watch whoever's on just because so interesting to see, well, this guy needs to get this guy on the ground. This guy needs to stand up and box. And there's just so many different styles in it. It's almost like watching the Pokemon fight, right? Everyone yeah, has yeah, their yeah. own elements. Um, yeah. Do you have any predictions for the upcoming um, Stipe versus Ngane this weekend? Ngane. Ngane? Ooh, yeah. That is an interesting prediction. Um, yeah. We'll see how it plays out. I <laughs> I'll probably Stipe. be wrong, but <laughs> yeah, I'll probably be wrong, but you know, uh, why not? You think the power is going to gonna be the key to winning this fight? Oh, 100%. I mean, at that, that weight class, yeah, for sure. It's all power. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Ian, one of our fans wants to know, what was your college major? What was my college major? So I started in the sciences, then I moved into sport marketing and management. And then I actually did my master's in athletic administration and sport management. And then now, you know, I'm doing a rotational program with finances with Red Bull. So, you know, you can really do kind of whatever you want in college and then kind of move up to something different, but I really enjoyed it. It was, it was a lot of fun being able to, um, see how sport works from a administrative perspective or all the behind the scenes stuff. Cause I had experienced the athlete side, but I got to see all the other issues that go along with it. So. Thank you. Thank you. Ian. And for our final question of the blitz, um, Ian, what was your favorite team logo and favorite team uniform in ISL season 2020 counting out DC Tridents? So counting, not counting DC not Tridents, counting my DC favorite? Tridents. Oh, the Tokyo Frogs. I loved it. I love the green. I mean, uh, you knew you knew exactly what team they were on when they walked by and they did their little frog hops out. Oh, it was awesome. That's got to be my favorite. Kind of kind of sad I didn't get one of them, but they were still swimming, right, when I was not. So I couldn't be like, hey, give me your uniform. I know you need it, but <laughs> I want it. You guys could have swapped after the season. Well, yeah, I yeah, yeah. ended at a different time, but yeah. still. <laughs> yeah, so they, they were my favorite for sure. Okay, makes sense. Thank you, Ian. And Ian, this about concludes our podcast. But before I let you go, I wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe say a couple of words to your fans and to the fans of DC Tridents. Yeah, so, I mean, just thank you guys for all the support you had given to me personally and DC Trident um, over the course of season one and season two. Um, some of my best memories of swimming will still be coming out of ISL in Maryland. 
um, season one and just signing autographs for fans in Italy and Naples, like the fans there were incredible. And that's, that makes a big difference. Right. And I think um, it, it's really touching when you get to be able to sign something or get a cap to a kid that you don't really care about the cap, but I mean, they cherish it. Right. So just shout out to everybody that's been a supporter and, and, you know, kind of helped me on the journey of staying motivated and being excited for meets. Right. And it's, it's been awesome. Um, so thank you. And I hope some, someone listening to this now is the next person that, you know, goes and swims for DC Trident here in 10, 15 years. Right. So it's, uh, that, that's my hope. Um, that's my hope also. Um, thank you so much, Ian. And I mean, congratulations once again on an amazing career. And good luck on your post, post athletic career. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what, what you do in Red Bull. Um, yeah, we're thank interested you. in a partnership from the ISL perspective. <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully, hopefully in a couple of years I'll be able to swing that with you guys. But <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, but Ian, thank you so much once again, and to everyone watching, thank you for tuning in. Our next podcast will.